Ladies and gentlemen, Rex Bear Leak Project, how the heck are you? It's super awesome to speak with somebody that spent a year straight at the South Pole. Now, what did they see? We're going to talk about it. We've got Eric Hecker with us today. And Eric, it's super awesome to speak with you. I'm so glad you reached out to me. You've got a, a great background there on your screen also. Not only your background in the South Pole, but how the heck are you, man? I'm doing fantastic, Rex. Thank you very much for having me on the show today. Um, I've, I've been following you for a bit now, and I, I really love all the directions that you delve in. So I'm, I'm happy to be able to participate and, and share some of my experiences to hopefully make some connections for you and other folks. Yes. Awesome. Well, we're going to get into this. And ladies and gentlemen, he actually spent an entire year at this station in the um, South Pole called the Admonson Scott South Pole Station. And he actually lives to tell the tell. Did he see reptilian shapeshifters? Any Anunnaki? Did he see Planet X? Maybe all of the above? I don't know, but it, we're, we're going to get into it. Before we go too deep into this, though, I do want to thank my friends over at nightsolarlight.com. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of those night solar lights that I've been telling you about, and I'm going to turn it on real quick. It's really bright. So this thing is powered by the sun, so it's got a solar panel on the front of it, and it also has a motion detection system built into it. So if you have them outside, it picks up something. Boom, it turns on. You don't have to plug it into the wall. It has no additional batteries that it needs. It's discounted 51% off for Leak Project listeners. Just go to the link specific, nightsolarlight.com. Uh, I heard that crime is up about 40% in major cities since these lockdowns. And if you've got a bunch of lights outside, somebody comes to rob you, and then all of a sudden your house lights up, they might, it might be less of a target. I mean, maybe. I would hope so. So anyway, nightsolarlight.com. Get yours today. Order several. And let's jump into this, Eric. So how did you get out there, man? Like, did you just pull a straw or you got no, the right I, one? It was, um, I was uh, a New York resident back in 2009, 10 period. And I had, um, I had a company over there and, and the economy was tanking. Everybody remembers that. So I was just looking for other avenues to, to you know, generate an income. And there was not much going on in the world at the time, literally in the world at the time for a plumber. I was, I was looking everywhere and I had applied to a couple of positions on the other side of the country. And one of them was, uh, it said it was in Centennial, Colorado as the listing was placed. Um, but when I applied, they got back to me, informed me that it was actually uh, for a position in Antarctica. And I was, okay. And then, um, then it turned out to be at the South Pole station and you know, long, long story short, I wound up getting this contract where it was, you know, initially supposed to be for the summer season. Uh, but then on doing well for the summer season, I was given a, a winter contract to, to stay in winter over and, and carry out the entire year. So I did. So I, I did 366 days straight, uh, November of 2010 and ended in November of 2011. And it was quite the year. What, what's it like out there when you, when you, first of all, tell us what it's like getting there. 10 four. So it's, it's a lot of flying uh, left off the West coast out of LA uh, flew over to, it was um, Auckland, New Zealand. We landed in first and then we jumped from Auckland over to Christchurch in Christchurch. You gear up at the United States Antarctic program facility, the, the, the USAP program. Uh, oddly enough, it's funny. USAP uh, is another term in the, secret ops. But anyhow, the, uh, the USAP program gears you up to now go further south and they fly you south to McMurdo Station in a C-17, which is a, a military plane. It's, it's Air Force. And then from McMurdo Station, you then jump onto a Herc. Most people flying in a Herc. There's some other smaller stuff they might move things around in at the front and aft end of the season. But most of the main body movements are done in a, in a Herc. So Take a herc. I got I got lucky actually. I actually got to go in the cockpit for the leaving McMurdo. So I was in the cockpit of the Herc. I actually have a video of that. I need to find that. But um that was fun. So went to South Pole in the Herc, landed, and then um, you know, the they just discharge you and, and dump fuel and grab garbage and head out. So landing at the pole was very interesting. They they swing the um the port side hatch open on the on the front end of the Herc, and the airmen, you know opens the door and you go to exit. And this, this is actually, it was funny and frustrating because when I walked out the hatch, there's an airman there and the prop is spinning. It's idling. I mean, this plane's, you know, it's humming. And the guy looks me dead in the face and he goes, make a right. 
And I was like, what? You really, what did you think I was going to make a left into the prop? Like, really? I made it this far. Come on. I'm not that knuckleheaded. So that was landing at the South Pole and you get, you get hit in the face with minus 50 degree ambient temperature. So that was, that was, I mean, the door opens, it comes in and you, you kind of feel like this breeze, but you're still in that heated space. But once you breach that door, it's minus 50 ambient and you're at 9,300 feet of elevation. You're so at 9,300 feet out there? Yeah, yeah. A lot of people don't know that. The ice I had no is idea. Wild. Yeah, people don't understand Antarctica in the slightest. So South Pole Station is at 9,300 feet of elevation and the atmosphere is non-existent. It is literally 0% humidity, literally. 0% humidity, minus 50 degrees, 9,300 feet of elevation. You try to take your bag and walk towards the building and you can't breathe. There's, there's like no, there's no air in the air. And the, you know, I'm, I'm a plumber, so I'm used to doing work. You know, I feel tough, right? But now I can't breathe. It takes, takes the life out of you. But now the, another funny thing was now a girl from the station who had wintered over and is completely acclimated comes over in like a long sleeve shirt, a ball cap and like glove liners on. Like I'm freezing to death and can't move. She's completely acclimated and like throwing sea bags on her shoulders and like running them into the station. And I'm just like, I remember looking at her and be like, I wonder if she'll carry me. <laughs> but it was, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a different environment. It takes, um, it takes weeks for you to get solidly acclimated to be able to labor and, and not get instantaneously winded. You know, the first, first two to three days that you're there, even as a tradesman, they didn't really ask me to do anything, just to observe, learn the procedures, help as best as you can, but get acclimated. Don't, don't force yourself. Um, you, can, you can get um, pulmonary edemas and things like that, high altitude um, illnesses and things like that um, can just happen. And there's really, there's no way to test folks for that. You either suffer from it or you don't. And they just find out, they let you off the plane and, and everybody's got to acclimate and they see who does and they see who doesn't. And the people that don't, they get chucked right out. I mean, there was that astronaut, uh, Neil Armstrong went there and he couldn't hack it. He had to leave. I thought that was hilarious. Neil Armstrong, he went to the moon, but as soon as he got to the South Pole, they had to evac him. He couldn't handle it. That is wild. That is absolutely wild. And, and to be, to experience that, you know, that's, that's a once in a lifetime opportunity experience. Most people don't even have that opportunity. So bravo for that. And I can imagine that being quite the humbling experience. <laughs> when you get there, you see some chick, she's like, hey, <laughs> well, you know, she's walking in, like you said, and, yeah. and you're just like, oh. you know, your teeth yeah. are like frozen off practically. They're shattered. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, give credit where credit is due. The, as far as I was concerned, the girl is just, she was a savage. Good on her. You know, I was the one that was floundering. <laughs> you know, but it is, it is what it is. So, okay, so how long total did it take you to get there? Like with, with all the flights and everything, would you say? Oh, geez. Up? Well, if you added it from New York all the way over, I mean, I went from New York to, um, to, to Colorado for training. Technically, we paused in Colorado for some training sessions, then from Colorado to LAX. So it would have been 13 hours from LA to Auckland, about 13, 13 and a half hours to Auckland. I think the leg from Auckland to Christchurch was maybe, maybe an hour, if that. Um, but then from Auckland to McMurdo, uh, weather pending, I, I'm trying to recall our specific flight, but the C-17 probably would have got us from Auckland to McMurdo, uh, say three and a half to five and a half hours, maybe. And then, um, then, and then from McMurdo to Pole was 950 miles inland, technically. So as a Herc flies, and weather, I mean, that, that's all over the place. I think our flight was maybe three or four hours. Wow. So, I mean, it, it takes a few days. Regardless, it's going to take you a few days. Oh, yeah. Days. Yeah. Now, you, they don't just shoot you right into pole. It doesn't, it's not that easy. I actually got there pretty expeditiously because I didn't get hung up in McMurdo. I didn't even, I didn't even spend 24 hours in McMurdo, going or coming. Either way, when I went to pole... I, I blitzed right through McMurdo Station and same thing on the way out. 
So what's McMurdo Station like? Now that is the first one in Antarctica, <clears throat> right? Um, it's, it's the biggest one right now. Um, it's certainly not the first. We've had other facilities there. Little America, all kinds of different facilities have been in Antarctica, even from our science stuff. Um, but McMurdo is certainly the biggest one right now. And I believe they're in the middle of doing a massive overhaul of that facility as well. What, was that where there used to be a small nuclear reactor that had all sorts of problems? Yes, there was. There was a, a PM8 reactor, if I remember correctly, that was at McMurdo for certain. Um, and I, I, <laughs> I questioned the existence of one at Pole at some point in time. Did you have a Geiger counter when you were out there? I did not. Not, not that I knew of, but I, I, know, I know of issues. I know of other things that were indicative of questions and problems and troubles. And it's part, it's part of me deciphering my experience is that at the time when I was there, um, I was, you know, certainly an open-minded questioning person, but my mind isn't, my mind wasn't where it was now then. So I didn't have a lot of these questions in my head when I was there the first, you know, the first time I went there, you know, I was very tradesman oriented and, you know, I, I was understanding of hidden history and all kinds of things and the such. Um, but I hadn't expanded my consciousness uh, appropriately enough to ask all the right questions when I was there. Yeah, so when did you go there? To, to, November 2010 until November 2011, and it was, uh, it was 366 days straight, effectively, that I was on the ice. Jeez. So, I, I, I'm sorry, so could, could you say the first part of that again, real quick? You, I, was re I just started reading your text when you sent me that. So, oh, no worries. <laughs> when did you go there first? What year was I it? Went, I went in November of 2011. I'm sorry, November of 2010 was when I departed to go to the South Pole. Okay. And I returned in November of 2011. It was a total of 366 days that I was on the ice. And that was, have you been there since then? No, that was okay. it. The reason I asked is you said the first time I went there, I was like, oh, did he go there again? Sorry. No, no, that's so a slip of my tongue. <laughs> he did go there again, folks. He just came talking <laughs> about it. <laughs> um, as far as the recording goes, I don't know where I need to give you permission. So this is what don't I can do. Chuck it to me after the fact. As, yeah, as soon as we finish up, I'm going to send you the link directly. I'll send it by a Dropbox, and you can you got feel it. free to use it and share it uh, worldwide. And so another thing that I want to get into on this is the um, – you, you go to McMurdo Base, mm -hmm. and, and, how, and you weren't there for very long, but what were the people like – that you had a chance to meet there. What, what would explain the surroundings to us? You got it. Mc, McMurdo was like, um, it's like, a, it's like a, it's like a, a, a moderately sized mining camp would be my best way to explain it. It's extremely, it's just industrial. Everything is function before form. It's not for beauty. It's kind of run down things, you know, have a, a they look kind of dilapidated. I mean, it, it's a harsh environment. So like straight up, like the fact that you can have things running in Antarctica is an accomplishment. Um, but it's, it's not tall. It's, uh, there's, there's a good view. That's the cool thing about McMurdo is you're right on the edge of the water. You have um, Erebus, the volcano that you can see from McMurdo. So that's really cool. Um, it's mostly, uh, it's like crushed gravel on the ground, mostly when it's not covered in ice and snow. So it's not very lush or green or anything like that. It's, it's very dark and, you know, there's not much flora and fauna. There's a skua as far as birds in the vicinity that I saw. And they're like just gigantic seagulls. And they, um, they're all over the place looking for food. They're massive scavengers and they're not afraid of humans. Like if you walk outside and you have a tray of food or something, they'll, they'll just come right at you. They'll, they'll, you know, come pecking at you while other ones come get the tray. It's, it's, you're in mother nature's environment there. Is it as cold out there? It is. It is at, at, at times they are similar. I would say probably on the, on the, on the, the shoulder seasons. They're probably similar, uh, but in the summertime, in the wintertime, they're going to have more drastic fluctuations. It gets much warmer in the summertime at McMurdo and much colder at South Pole in the wintertime. Uh, McMurdo gets much higher winds. They have a lot of windstorms on the coast at McMurdo that get savage, like 100 mile an hour sustained 
winds and stuff like that that we would get reports in the winter time from McMurdo that they were getting crushed by wind you know and, and you know we would just be like well we're just we're just turning into ice cubes <laughs> But McMurdo was had, a, I think, 1,500 some odd folks there when I was passing through. Big, huge galley that everybody eats at commonly. All kinds of different residences um, that are popped all over the place just, you know, for convenience of connecting things, it seemed like. McMurdo seems almost like, um, like they just kept stacking things and, and placing things that they never really intended for it to grow that big. And it seems that the overhaul they're intending now, I guess, is going to consolidate it and make it a bit more organized. Yeah, it's interesting. I've heard there's a lot of jobs that are being, um, that are in the newspaper mm-hmm. in the Northwest for positions in Antarctica. And it's been that way for a few years. Yep. Yeah. That, for some reason, they, 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 they target that area for who they're hiring. I don't know why. I, I Fishermen can, are hard workers, man. Well, you know something? That's true. And they're used to working in rough conditions, harsh conditions. Um, I, yeah, I mean, the conditions that I worked in at South Pole in the wintertime, I mean, I can look back and laugh now because I, I did it. But I, I guess I do often wonder what other folks would do if they were there. I mean... It was, it was rough sometimes, you know, we had, um, you know, every, we used to joke around at South Pole and say that everything was, you know, it was just massive amounts of boredom, um, broken up by bouts of sheer terror. And we, you know, we would have primary systems break down and, you know, next thing you know, I think, well, we had our, we had, um, our primary water system break down one day and that's out in an outbuilding, not in our main facility. And the, the problem was the boilers broke down that heated the space that made the energy to melt the water to keep us having un- basically it's called a rod well so underneath the ice it's an up do- upside down water tower that we melt the ice we maintain it as melted and then we pull the water out of it because it's so fresh and pure and that's our water supply but the boilers that broke in the rod well heated the building and provided the energy needed to keep the water in liquid form so this broke in the middle of winter. It was minus 93 degrees out ambient, I think, that day. And we had to spend 23 hours straight bringing that rod well back up online. And that was, that was the hardest fix that I've ever done in my life was, was 23 hours straight in minus 93 degrees. And we just, we, we had a mission and we had to get the water back on. And the whole station knew it. And they were doing what they could to help. I mean, I was, I was in a state of work. I kept working. We were trying to get these hoses and stuff from the pump out of the ice. And I was just in action. There were literally people putting food in my mouth while I just kept working. Because we, need, we didn't have time. There was systems were just going to, once something broke, Mother Nature is going to keep encroaching. And if we, could not, if we could not maintain the rod well, we would have lost it. And we didn't have the capacity to restart one. So maintaining was was a priority, and we had a very short window to do that. And <laughs> in that process, we, we had to actually stop the Rodwell repair to go into the ice tunnels because we had learned in the summer season that without the Rodwell up and without proper circulation in the ice tunnels, even though they were heat traced without flow, we were going to lose our distribution system. So I had to convince the facility engineer that in the middle of our Rodwell emergency that we had to change gears, I had to pull labor off, go into the ice tunnels, drain down the ice tunnels so that they didn't freeze while we were trying to get the Rodwell up and running so that we would have a distribution system once the rod well was up and running. So I had, to, I had to pull up some information from a repair that we did in the summer season that the winter engineer wasn't there for. And I had to very rapidly say, look, this, 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 and this. And because of that, we need to do this. And he just looked at me and he said, all right, get who you need, do what you got to do, hurry up. So we went down to the tunnels. We drained out the water as fast as we could. And um, that was also very interesting too, because it's a, now that those ice tunnels were minus 60 degrees, and they're just ice. It's tunnel, tunnel ways that we carve in the ice to run utilities through. So we popped open this, this drain, a low point on the system, and we start releasing water that's water. I mean, so it's over 32 degrees. It was probably 40, 50 something degree water that we're now launching fresh into the ice that's two miles thick. So it just starts boring it like a hole. 
and it's just shooting into the ice below us and boring a hole out. And it's, and it's also um, because of the 0% humidity as the water's coming out, it's also, uh, it's um, gassing. It's, um, what's the word, sublimating basically. So it's just going right to gas so fast. It's filling up the tunnel because we can't see now and it's drilling a hole under us. And now the ice starts all cracking and making those horrible calving sounds. <laughs> so me and this guy, Dan, we're down there. We start climbing up onto the utility piping because they're, they're drilled into the side. They're anchored into the side, not supported from the floor. And now we were worried that we had now just basically undermined the, the ice below us by draining this way because we, we had never had to do an emergency drain like this before. So capturing it was not our priority. And the outcome of draining like this, we, we didn't expect. Um, so we had to start crawling back on the utility piping because we didn't even trust the ice below us anymore and didn't want to go dropping down to God knows how deep. But we got, the, we got the pipes drained, and then we got back to the tunnel outside and then um, went back out to the rod well, and we got the rod well fixed. And we were able to redistribute the water afterwards and um, we were able to maintain having our primary water system for the rest of the winter season for the for the 49 folks that were there. I'm looking up as you're talking, I'm trying to find a Rodwell system to, to get mm -hmm. an idea more so on what you're doing. So what would I type in? I type in what's a Rodwell system and I don't type, type in um, uh, Rodriguez well. Rodwell is short for Rodriguez, the inventors. Rodriguez, Rodriguez. well. well. South Pole. Yeah, type in Rodriguez well, South Pole. Um, wow, I think this is it right here. Let's. Uh... It should look like a bulb, a water yeah. tower. Up yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so, so what we're looking at right here? Mm -hmm. Is this it? Yeah. That's effectively what's it going to look like down in the ice. Um, Yeah, that looks like stats on the energy it takes because <laughs> once they remove all the water from a rod well, it becomes an outfall. So once the, all the water goes out, then we replumb it so that all the waste from the facility goes into it. So these rods right here, are these, a part, are these the rod wells? Um, those would be the pipes. The, 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 the way the rod well works is you have a boiler system up on the top basically okay. a jack and then they have um, a big, huge hose reel that they have a, like a, a pump head on, like a... Like a Oh, which like a pressure washer head, so to say, right? Okay. And then they shoot hot water through that and they drop it down and they bore it through the ice. And then when they get down to say about 500 feet, they'll change the head so that it has a outward pattern. So it's not just boring downward. So then when they put the other head on, it sprays more around so that they can manufacture that bulb. And then when they get it to where it has about a half a million gallons of water in it, at that point, they just um, now run a system of recirculating water through it. So they have a boiler up top with a heat exchanger and then a, a plate heat exchanger system and some circulators. And then that other side, the, the well side of the plate heat exchanger now has a circulator on it that's maintaining that bulb above freezing. And then that's our water supply for the South Pole residents. And then wow. there's, a, there's a line, there's a suction line that can now pull from the half a million gallons of water. And then we, we have to, we, I mean, these are things that we have to do on the maintenance staff every day. You have to go check the rod wells. You have to, there's all kinds of things that you have to check. You got to dip for, you know, well overall depth and stuff like that. All, all kinds of things. Check for water volumes, check for overall bulb depth. These are the things that we had to maintain every day or, or we're not going to make it through the winter. So let's say that you and the crew were not able to fix that rod well system. Mm -hmm. then what we had a secondary backup system it was a snow melter um, underneath the um, emergency pod that we had in the elevated station which was a backup heating system separate from our primary heating and power generating system so in that emergency pod we had connections in the subflooring that were to take our our glycol loop our glycol supply and we could plumb it down out of the facility into a melt box. And that melt box basically had a radiator in it, a really 
big fancy stainless steel radiator basically. So we would run the glycol through the radiator, basically exhausting heat. But this big box was, you know, lined and we could take a loader and we could go scoop up snow, drop it into the melt box. And using the glycol loop, we could then heat that up and, and manufacture water as a backup. But that would have been horrible if we had to go in that direction because it would, it would have completely limited our operations because it, it was a drastic uh, production loss to go from the primary to the secondary. So there were about 50 people there at any given time, that base? Uh, for our winter season, it was 49. For the summer season at the South Pole, it had gotten as high. In the, it was in the 270s, which was a lot for that year. But it was a big year because we were, um, we were converting the ice cube neutrino detector um, on from construction. And then same thing with the, the South Pole station itself. We were the transition team from construction to operations and maintenance. Jeez. Uh, potentially, though, like if, if you guys were out of – power or didn't have a power source mm -hmm. how much time would you have for survival uh if we had no power source i mean if all of our if we lost everything all our redundancies and everything failed like you mean like just total catastrophic failure yeah catastrophic failure how much time uh, you got? we wouldn't we wouldn't have lasted probably we wouldn't have lasted a, a week but there's no way that's we would have lost heat there's I mean, there's plenty of food, so to say, but at those temperatures without a source of heat, I mean, we're talking minus 90 degrees ambient in the middle of winter. Insulation and all of that stuff is good if you have a source of heat. If you're telling me I don't have a source of heat, I'm telling you we're not making it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Could you start like a fire out there? I mean, is there anything to make a fire with besides equipment and gasoline? Yeah, and then it's going to melt into the ice and put itself out. <laughs> So the yeah, structures I mean, it was, it themselves, was, are they made out of like steel? Say this again? The structures, are they made out of steel? Yeah, yeah. So the, the elevated station itself is it, it's sitting on stilts. So it looks like it's just got these stilts going into the ground like legs. And they can be jacked up and, and elevated to keep bringing the station up. Um, but in reality, those legs go down into a steel skeleton. There's a massive substructure underneath that keeps those legs from moving and shifting because that facility technically it's, it's riding a glacier, all that whole, everything's moving. Um, so for all practical purposes, the geographical South pole is the geographical South pole. And every single year, the facility moves 33 feet away from it closer to the shore. Think about that. You're at the top, you're at the bottom of the world effectively, but now just flip it upside down. Now think of it like you're on the top as far as gravity is effectively concerned or glaciation movement. So when you're at the top, everything's moving down towards the coast. So the South Pole Station's in movement. It's moving 33 feet a year. I'm a glacier rider. I rode a glacier for 33 feet. Man, now everybody's going to start calling you a Freemason because you said the number 33. And even if you are, that's cool. But every time somebody brings up that number, it's like, oh, I knew it. He it's, works for them. It is, it is a mission critical number, technically, in a, lot of, in a lot of people's textbooks, technically. Yeah, yeah. And 33 is also the apex number, isn't it? It's like the, uh, in the pyramid, 33 apex. Anyway, so. 33 so vertebrae in our spine. Dude, I knew it. See, he's one of them, folks. He has 33 vertebrae in his spine. Oh, my. My eyes just <laughs> blinked sideways. You weren't looking, Rex. <laughs> hey, that's cool. That's cool. Sometimes I go reptile mode. It's all right. You know, um, reptiles' lives matter. There you go. <laughs> okay, so let's go back to what, what were you going to say? What did you say? I was going to say, that would be a good T-shirt, like Draco lives matter. <laughs> oh, that'd be kind of scary. I don't know about that. Yeah, it also was like, ah! You know, people the wings pop out of the back, and then anyway, yeah. vultures start eating. Um, Why can't we all just get along? <laughs> can we all just get along? <laughs> then the unicorns come out and save the day. Unicorns' That's lives cool. matter. Unicorns' lives matter. So, the, how many days of sunshine do you get out there? Um, half half a year's worth. Um, literally. So here's the other thing: the when you're at the actual South Pole facility you experience over the course of a year one 
celestial day. At the South Pole, it takes 365 days for the sun to have one cycle. It goes up and down once. Now, perspective while you're at the South Pole is that you now just see in the summertime is the sun is just going around you at the horizon. And then over the course of the fall, um, the um, solstices are different. So December 21st is the summer solstice. So when I arrived in November, I was privy to the sun working its way around the horizon, but getting higher and higher every day until the circle was tight and now it's above you. And then I get to see it go back down again and then eventually drops below the horizon line and then it's just gone until the next year. It's gone. It's pitch black. And the coolest thing that you could ever see in your life, technically on this planet, as far as I'm concerned, is the South Pole Station in the winter time on a crisp day because of the 9,300 feet of elevation, right? So imagine this, you turn your back so that there's no facilities anywhere. It's just the horizon and space above it and you. You simply take your head and you lift it up a couple of degrees. The earth now drops out of your field of view because it was just simply the flat horizon and you're now in space technically because you don't see anything else. There's nothing else in your field of view. Tilt your head up. You can turn 360 degrees now, and you are in space. The most beautiful clusters, the density of stars. You can watch the Iridium satellites go by with clarity. You can see everything. It was so gorgeous. Auroras, when auroras would fire up. Um, again, this is why I said I, I like having this light because it, you know, perspectively reminds me of the aurora australis because you can't get it if you're not there so to say pictures video of an aurora do zero justice to witnessing one in real life I, and i can only assume especially at the south pole station because it's so dark i mean I, I know the crews that work there and the tricks that they would have to do to the camera to get it to just to function to have enough of a light in that environment to get exposure of the aurora would wash it out so much that it's it's none of the none of the detail is in it anymore that what you get to witness in real life and it looked way more to me like um flames like rolling flame tips and things like that instead of like in the movies where it looks almost like just like wavy stuff like they make it just look like blotches of green and blue swimming around like swirling in an ocean like more like what this looks like up on my ceiling it looks more like that when you see it in videos and things but in real life there's more there's more precision to the edges on the stuff and it's it looks more like fire to me it looked way more like fire what is the explanation of the the lights the auroras, it's, it's the interactions with the, 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 the sun discharge and the magnetosphere, the angle of the planet, and, and that's why it's most visible by the poles and in darkness. So because I happen to be literally at the pole and in pure darkness, I got to see auroras that are like beyond description, freakishly gorgeous. Um, we were in the middle of an event one day. We had... Um, the 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 tunnel system we have um, maintained ends that protrude out of the ice that we can bring gear in and out of and they have um snow accreting over the course of the winter up at the top we call it a snow cornice and we would have to cut those off the roof line with a, a big rope and a team to you know it's a, it's a substantial amount of weight that if it fell on someone it would hurt them so for safety's sake, we're cutting these cornices off. We're outside, wintertime, South Pole. And all of a sudden, in the middle of us working, like this glow comes down on us. And like, you know, it's, it's pretty dark out that day, but, but like the color changed. And we looked up and there was this complete ring of green aurora above us in total motion. It was in a fury of like it was like like a, like it was like a tube almost like it, like it was shooting and spinning through this ring and we were like wow look at that and um it looked like it was coming in from one side like as if there was something inserting more energy into it 
and it was like loading up, loading up, loading up, and the ring would get like, like bigger and faster and more crazy, and it would do that for a little bit, and then all of a sudden, it was like from the side where the energy was coming in, 180 degrees across from the circle, the opposite side, after it went wild for a bit, it was like it would blow out the other side. And it was, we were just sitting there watching and we stopped, we all stopped working. We were all laying on our backs, just looking up at this. And it was really cool. And we called it up, you know, we'd say, look, 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 it's, it's charging up again. And that would be like when it would start reinserting from the, the, the filling side. And then it would go all crazy, crazy, crazy again and blow out the other side. And it was just like, I don't know what the heck we were looking at technically, but it was just insanely awesome. You know, we're watching the energies of the galaxy blending with our planet, like right before our eyes is what was going on. And it was really cool. Now, what kind of gear did you have? That is cool. That's awesome. What kind mm -hmm. of gear did you have to um, have in order to go out and work unless you're that chick that is super huge? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, and Rex, just for the record, at the end of my winter season, I was as tough as that girl. I swear. Nice. I believe it, dude. I totally but, believe it. But it takes time. But the gear, great question. Um, it's tons and tons of gear. Um, in the worst of worst conditions, I would be wearing 30 to 40 pounds of clothing. Between, I mean, like between like the boots, the base layers. Um, I would have 14 pieces of headgear that I would have to layer on. I should dig that stuff out. I still have, I could, I could do a show and show people like, hey, listen, this is what I would have to do to put to get dressed, you know, but yeah, it was a substantial amount of gear. And, um, you know, if we had to go outside with other folks, like a lot of people didn't have to exit the building at all, technically. Um, but sometimes they would want to go out just to see what it was like. And they would want to go do rounds with like the maintenance crew and go out to the other buildings and things. And we would, we would take people on tours of the facility and it was a lot of fun, but we'd have to dress them basically too. Like we'd have to like, be like, all right, you know, go bring all of your clothes, meet me down. Um, you know, by, by DZ, which is, you know, the destination Zulu, we called it was a primary exit point. So, you know, go, go meet me down in the coat room by DZ, bring all your stuff, you know, and you'd be sitting there, you know, put this sock here, or tuck this pant leg in here. Um, it wasn't even like, it had a lot to do with how you assembled it. So forget the, like the base layers and all like that's common stuff, but I mean, literally assembling it so that you can go out there and not have it get messed up. I've made mistakes before. It happens. There's, there's no correction. Once you're out in the elements, um, as an example, I was walking one time and I, I was returning to the elevated station from um, one of the telescopes in the dark sector. I had done my rounds. I was headed back. I had put all my headgear on and it was a very stormy day out, very hard to see. And I was trying to follow a flag line to get back. And I, I could feel that part of my face was exposed. And it felt like um, someone was hitting it with a sandblaster as like the cold wind and the snow was, was blitzing into it. And I remember being like, damn it, I, I screwed up. I totally screwed up. So I was like, I was trying to readjust my gear out out with no mirrors or anything. So I don't even know if I'm accomplishing anything at this point, you know, so I'm trying to get this spot that's exposed covered. And I, I, I move things around and I'm like thinking in my head, all right, you know, I'm going to, I'm like blowing warm air up in that direction, you know, underneath all of my gear. And I thought I had it covered. I'm like, Oh yeah, it doesn't hurt anymore. I'm great. I get back to the elevated station. I open the door. I tear down all of my gear. I start turning the corner to go down towards the galley and get some coffee. And the engineer comes walking up to me and he goes, what the hell happened to your face? And it turns out, I guess, uh, I guess I didn't get it covered at all. It just went numb. I had this big blasting frostbite spot on my cheek where it was exposed. Now, how long was that there? Oh, it probably stayed on my cheek for maybe a week or so. There's, so it would happen. Every now and then you'd see people, you, you could tell someone got bit. Like there'd be something that you could see something got exposed or, you know, people, it was a learning curve. Like I remember one time there was a girl had a big burn mark on her neck because she had um, a metal zipper. And the zipper was right on her neck and she it hadn't dawned on her what was going on and but long story short, yep, she got a big mark on her neck because her zipper froze to it. So how long did it take you to get back once you figured out that you've got this piece on your face that isn't covered? 
you know, I, was, your face. I was maybe about four minutes away from the station at that point. It happened in four minutes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's, yeah, there's not a lot of time for things to go wrong when you're outside the facilities there. We had, we had to train really hard and know um, where to go. And whiteout conditions were extremely challenging. Um, to not get lost was a big deal. We always had to have, um, we had like warm rooms, uh, escape rooms, like to, to escape the environment, like if something went wrong. Um, yes, we had radios as well and, and backup batteries that you're supposed to bring. We had all kinds of protocols for when you, when you exited the building. I mean, it was, it was no joke. We're talking, I mean, yes, you, you can die fast. In four minutes, you can be frozen to death. And there's, you're going to have a radio going off and people asking, are you all right? <laughs> so, yeah, you had, to, you had to be very critical of what you were doing. You had to know where you were going. Um, lots of times when I was walking around outside, going from building to building in, in, in certain conditions, I was just looking around and trying to pay attention to what I might have seen last or my time since I last saw something. Because if I had to make an emergency call, I have to give them intel. I have to give them actionable intel. I can't just be walking around like, dur, 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 you know, like I could, I could fall in a hole and now I don't see anything, but I have my radio. Now what do I do? You know, so you have to be ready at all times for things to go wrong. And um, things do go wrong. I mean, more often than not, it was pretty boring. You're just walking around checking on things. But we did have things go wrong. I mean, when alarms went off, it was serious. You, you had to snap too and get things corrected post haste. There's mother, mother nature is not your friend at the South Pole. Um, we had a lot of issues with mother nature. You know, she wasn't our friend there. She was, she was, she was trying to kill us. I mean, for all practical purposes, um, there was a lot of criticisms of that task too. You know, we all did what we had to do. Um, but once you're there, it's a, it's a have to do thing. And um, nobody can really prepare you for what you're going to have to do in your winter season at Pole. Um, they would say, uh, it's not quite hell, but you can see it from there. Uh, I mean, that sounds so extreme that I wonder how they even got there in the first place. Um, there oh, was... Yes. Share that yeah. with me. Oh, my God. You're, you're, you're so right, Rex, because you're, you're right. One of the things that I'm a tradesman. So I, the South Pole experience was very humbling to me because I was there when, for all practical purposes, it's a five-star resort right now compared to the first crew that wintered over in 1957 that was basically doing it in Connexes and mill vans. And now when I was, when I was a summer contract there, we were actually lucky enough. There was some anniversary going on and they got on the phone for us. We were in the conference room at the South Pole and we got to have a phone conversation with what was left of the original 1957 winter over crew. And that was a great conversation. The guys that first went there. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, <clears throat> I've seen Prince. We, um, <laughs> We blew up the old pole when we were there. So the pole that was there in 1957, um, it was decided that it should be collapsed by dynamite in 2010. So that happened while I was there as well. And I, maybe that was the reason that triggered them uh, letting us talk to those guys now that I think about it. And the, uh, that facility was, for our grid, they were grid north of us. And it was a sprawling facility, but it was very old fashioned. It was just an old military type thing, you know, like the, the you know, Korean War tents, which we still maintained in the summer season. Um, but that type of stuff, it was very rudimentary military style. Um, it, it got buried. Most of it was the intention was that they would um, like almost taken like a connex and, and, you know, how they do these, uh, what do you call these things now? These tiny home things with all the metal mill container vans. homes. Yeah. So it's, it was, it was very similar to stuff like that. Like it was just very modular. Um, what could be flown in by plane and like Lincoln logged together. It was very rudimentary, nothing like what they have now. So those guys, those guys, man, Oh, I don't know. The, the, <laughs> the audacity to winter over for the first time at the South pole. I mean, I don't know that I can have more respect for a man that did that. That's crazy. It is. Even here in Colorado at higher elevations where you've got this mining equipment that I don't know how they'd get it up. I mean, it'd be difficult enough to get it up there with semi-trucks. They were pulling it up there with horses. 
and it, you know, 12, 13,000 feet elevation, extreme cold, mm. major amounts of snow. Not the extremity that you're talking about with Antarctica, but I, I'll bet you there's places up in the mountains in Colorado that are 50 below at certain times, has been noted, and um, whiteout conditions. I've, so with, I've, I've been to plenty of places here in Alaska that are quite remote as well. Alaska is a savagely right. big state, so I do, remote, I do remote work here as well, stuff that's fly in, fly out. I've done remote gold mines, remote research facilities here. Yeah, folks, this, this is a big world. Go check it out. Get out of your town. Like, go look at the world. It's awesome. Oh, Alaska's amazing. And so I guess that's about as close as you're going to get to Antarctica. If you go all the way up to the top of Alaska, you can be um, in, in some pretty extreme conditions. But so let's go back to you made a comment about there, you feeling there could have been a reactor there, a nuclear reactor? I, I have. Looking at the history of the world, Rex, let's just put it, this is, this is my speculation, okay? I, I'm speculating that there's so many programs out there that have done so many things before under the table, right? That it just, it leads me to believe why would this circumstance be any different? And if you pay attention to the, the history of Antarctica from every country's perspective and the treaties that were signed and things like that and the tactics of lawyers, Okay. Just because they said you can't bring in like new, like the treaty technically said from the signing of the treaty on, you can't do these things. It never said that you have to stop doing them if you're already doing them in a way, or that you would have to fess to them either. So, I mean, it just leads me to believe there's a lot of room for people to interpret things differently. And then if one person's interpretation was, it's fine, well, then it's just fine because there's technically, the, the Antarctic Treaty is basically, it's, it's a hands-off gentleman's agreement, basically. It really just means you do what you do, we'll do what we do, and we'll all just admit that we're just going to do the things we said we were going to do. Sound cool? Cool. That's the Antarctic Treaty. Everybody reserves the right to go check on each other's stuff, yet no one ever does it. So what's going on at everybody's facility? Whatever they say. You know, so I mean, and what has history shown us in these circumstances where we just let the powers that be be the powers that they are? Why was that location you were at so important? Because of the, the, the geographical location? I, I think initially it was a power play that when they initially were, were wintering in 1957, don't forget, they sent the military there. It wasn't a research crew. Um, this was, I think, a time where prior to the treaty, Antarctica was a free-for-all. And this is how every nation um, showed their presence in the world or their intentions um, was by moving militaries in. And that's what was going on in Antarctica at the time. And the treaty wasn't signed, and it was a land of resource. And people were trying to figure out what to do with that resource. And then, lo and behold, it became a, a protected thing. So things changed. The contract got signed. And now, all of a sudden, it wasn't about resources. It was about protection and science. So we're told by all the higher-ups of every single nation that gets to just sign a treaty to show up and then be part of the team that gets to say, we're just doing what we said we're doing. <laughs> now I'll tell you this, I have worked up in the northern parts of Alaska as well. And I've met other people who have confided in me and they said that they were working for companies that I'm familiar with their names on what we, we, well, we call it a cat train when you have tracked vehicles going out with um, birthing units and they go out into the middle of nowhere to do stuff on a cat train. So this dude was working on the cooking staff of a cat train and he confessed to me that, you know, he was listening to my stories about Antarctica and he was like, Oh, I've been to Antarctica too. I said, Oh, what, what did you do there? Oh, I was a cook on a cat train. Oh, what were you doing on the cat train? Traversing to pole? He says, no, we were looking on places to build missile silos. I went, excuse me. And he goes, yeah, we were looking for places to build missile silos. I go, you're not supposed to tell people that he goes, I don't care. And I said, okay. He goes, what are they going to do to me? I said, okay. 
That's okay. his story, not mine. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's, it's not my story. I'm just straight up telling you. That's a guy I met in Alaska telling me that he also worked in Antarctica, and he immediately said that to me. That guy sounds cool. I'd like yeah, to get him a couple he, of drinks and see what he says then. <laughs> we, we've actually done that, too. <laughs> <laughs> he is a really cool guy. Great cook, too. Great cook. I would definitely want him anywhere I'm working. It would be... Um, it would make sense to have a weaponized system out there that would be clandestine. And then the next question that leads me to is, have you met people when you were out there that kind of showed up on the fly and, and you're like, who is this person? Who are these people? And they're gone. All the time. That's one, one of my criticisms now post um, South Pole visit is now I look back in hindsight and I have, it was really weirder now. Um, you're right. Like all the things that I know now is extremely interesting. How many people came and go, you wouldn't know who they are. It's, it could, it could totally, totally fit that way. I mean, you literally, there are times there's people coming and going, you never see one inch of their skin. They're just completely covered head to toe. I mean, technically Rex, I don't know. It was a person in there. You know, I, I don't know. I have no idea. Technically it was someone walking by me covered completely. And that happened all the time. Most people, you didn't actually see them. Now, how often? So, so that happened all the time. Now, would it be groups or would it be usually just one person? Combinations. Or? Combinations. Okay. And then there was also people that were com completely unaffiliated with at all. So we are at the South Pole, okay? We happen to be the facility. Well, the whole entire planet, there's people all over the planet that want to go to the South Pole. There's nothing technically stopping them if you have the budget. Um, so we would also have all kinds of folks showing up by whatever means they decided to get there. Different vehicles, people would manufacture peculiar vehicles and things like that because they, someone invested in this thing to get to the South Pole. I mean, we're not the only country in the world and there's, you know, other people and other folks have ideas. I've seen a lot of wacky things show up at the South Pole. No, oh, tell us about that. Um, there was one thing there's called the, um, the moon Regan expedition, I think it was. And it was like, they took a, the cockpit of a plane basically and stuck it on like three skis. There was like one ski in the front and like two skis in the back, but then behind the cockpit, it was like the, the propeller for a, um, like an airboat. So it was like they were airboating across the surface of Antarctica to get to the South pole. So like stuff like that, like all of a sudden, like you're out working and all of a sudden you just see this thing coming across the ice and you're like, what is, what is going on? Like, what is wrong with these people that are like risking their lives to get here? So first of all, that's awesome. <laughs> that is so cool. And second of all, that reminds me of uh, something, you know how your phone's always listening is I was um, driving out past the Bisty Badlands the other day in New Mexico and there's all these beautiful landscapes on the way there. And I oftentimes will envision myself in some type of wingsuit or Iron Man suit flying over everything, right? I'm like, Ooh. and then uh. so, but here's where it gets interesting. And the, the point to my story is I got home that night and, you know, I'm looking at my, uh, some of my YouTube feeds and stuff. And then all of a sudden there's these, these video feeds of people in wingsuits and jet packs and stuff. And I'm like, oh, oh, oh yep. he's listening. Oh, he's listening. And then I started saying stuff like, I love you, Google. Thank you, Google. Google, you deserve a break too. You work too hard. Come on, take a vacation. We love you. Uh, but anyway, anyway, that was just a pattern interrupt. And let's go back to the South Pole, man. This is awesome. You got people showing up. You don't know if they're extraterrestrials. You don't know if they're Sasquatch. You don't know if they're uh, space Nazis. You don't know what they are. Uh, Conversations they are. like this make me think about going back, actually, because like in, in a way, I would like to bring you back there, so to say, and show you everything because I know you would, you would totally love it. I was like, come on, Rex, let's go for a walk. Gear up. You'd be like, hell yeah. I'm, I'm game. I'm, I'm right? willing to get frostbite for that. Yeah. 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 yeah, minus 100 ambient, you would try it. Dude, and I'm part reptile, and I'd still be willing to do that. So I'm just oh, saying. Here's, here's, here's some numbers for you that you'll get a kick out of. I, I'm, I'm curious if you would have done this, Rex. I, I think you would have. Have you ever heard of the 300 Club? The, are you talking about the movie? Nope. The 300 no. Club. Uh -uh. It's a South Pole Club. So when the temperature gets down to minus 100 ambient, the weathermen let us know that it's, it's inbound. Okay. And 
what we do is we go and we, we fire up the sauna. We have a sauna on the first floor and we bring it up to at least 200 degrees. We brought it up to 214 because we're, we're nerds. So instead of the 300 club, we wanted to go for the 314 club, you know, pi 3.14. So we did the, we technically did the 314. We exceeded the 300 club. But what you do is you sit in the sauna, you have just your boots on and a towel, you get your birthday suit and you wait in the sauna with the radio and you wait for the weatherman to call in and let you know that the temperature has effectively hit minus 100. So at that point, we then charge out of the sauna, run out the exit door of the South Pole Station, you drop your towel, and then you proceed to run around the geographical South Pole in your birthday suit, and then get back inside before you freeze. And effectively, you're giving your body a 300 degree temperature difference exposure in the blink of an eye, because you're going from the sauna to the outside within 20 seconds. So we went from positive 214 to minus 100, and it's really cool because when you breach the door to get outside, um, you're already covered with sweat. So the sweat instantaneously is flashing to gas. You can literally, you can see sweat shooting out of you. Like you're creating a cloud right before your very eyes. You have to keep moving or you will um, you'll be in the middle of your own cloud and not be able to see anything. It'll become opaque. So you have to keep moving forwards at which point you are making a massive trail. It is unbelievable how much moisture you can see coming out of yourself. Um, you're trailing gas behind you like a cloud. And uh, this guy, Mike, and I were the first ones to breach the door for that particular event. Um, it was the first 300 club event of our season, and we were the first ones to get out the door. And <laughs> Mike was a radio guy, so he didn't, um, I didn't realize at the time that Mike didn't know where he was going. I was, I was the outside guy, but he wanted to go for, hey, no problem. I'm running behind <laughs> this six foot six giant naked dude, technically, for all practical purposes, <laughs> trying to keep from freezing to death. And all of a sudden, I'm like, this is, this is taking a while. And I'm like, Mike, where are you going? He's like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, let me get in front. <laughs> So we, we switched spots, I got us around the pole, and then um, we were running back towards the building. And just as Mike's about to open the door, it goes inward. So he's about to put his hand on the handle, and all of a sudden the door opens from inside, pulls inward, and now the next batch of people is coming running out from the sauna, and they're all completely warm, running out the door, but now there's a line of them. And we're like, come on, go, go, get out, of, move, move, get out of the door. <laughs> but we, we made it back inside. And um, the only, the only um, inflicted damage we found out was um, that in the rules of the 300 Club, we were actually tolerated to wear a balaclava over our faces. And we had not. And we should have because we had all destroyed our lungs on that run. Um, those temperatures, um, we burned off like a layer or something. I remember for like a, at least a couple of days, anybody who had done the 300 club um, on, our, on our rotation without the balaclavas, every time we would try to talk, you can only get a few syllables out and then your lungs just like, they hurt. It was just like too much too much wind activity or something going over them. It's like, you'd be trying to talk. You'd be like, Hey Rex, you know, how did everything go when, <laughs> when you, <were>, I'm <laughs> when you're, how did everything go when you were, <laughs> it's just something happened. Things you do when you get bored. Yeah. Yeah. Things to do at, at pole when you're bored, when it's minus hundred degrees out. <laughs> somebody, uh, somebody asked the question, do you really want a six foot six naked guy behind you in Antarctica? <laughs> I said, well, some might, <laughs> but up, uh, okay. Yeah, technically. So, that, we, all right. <laughs> wow. Wow. There's all kinds um, of ways to fight hypothermia. I have my preferences <laughs> and six foot six dudes are not them. <laughs> Would you like to spoon? No, thank you. <laughs> oh man. So did you ever explore out there? Yes. Tell us about that. Um, geez. Um, there's a couple of facilities that were, were um, theoretically shut down. So I would like to meander, I guess you would say. That was always fun. Um, and then the surfaces, 
um, just to get away, let's just say. Um, there, was a, there was a point in time, I would say that I misappropriated a snow machine, technically. And I drove that thing as far away as I could until the entire facility was a little dot. <laughs> and it was just way off in the distance. And I just did it because when am I going to have the chance to do that again? You know? And I, I had someone with me and it was pretty interesting. She, you know, what if this thing breaks down or blah, 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 blah. I said, don't we just walk back. We just say, we don't, what snow machine? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I said, we'll get back eventually. <laughs> but that was, it was fun. You know, we just motored out and just went to where it was, the, it's, there's nothing, there's nothing. So the, the South Pole station was a little dot on the horizon. And I, I knew where that was. We had our track that we rode out on technically. Um, but if we had gone much further and lost that track, I mean, that would have been a wrap. <laughs> if a storm had blown in, if the weather had changed. Um, but it was, a, it was a good clear day. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I chose the right day and we made it back. So it was, you know, it worked. Is there anything out there besides nothing? Not on the surface. Not on the surface at all. There's nothing. There's not a mountain. It is flat. It is white. There are many, many days where the atmospheric conditions make your whole world monochromatic. I mean, seriously, like being inside a ping pong ball, the, 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 the sky, the floor, everything is the exact same color, hue, shading on many days. And walking can be very challenging because you look down and there's no, there's no perspective to anything. Literally, it's the weirdest thing. Like you, you, you can watch your foot as you're going to place it on the ground and you really can't tell. Like if I said to you, Rex, like tell me when your foot's going to hit the ground, you're never really going to get it right. You'll be close and guess, but you'll always be a hair off. Like things just don't look right. So walking gets challenging because um, sometimes when you can't see the ground, um, there's still uh, sastrugi, the, the drifting snow and stuff like that. So there's, there's different um, heights and elevations to things. There could be a drop or something like that. And you just don't see it. You know, so you're walking and you don't know all of a sudden that the ground is now eight inches lower than what you anticipated it to be. So you're dropping into a hole, you jam your knee, you fall over, you get back up. You don't know why you fell technically because you didn't see anything. And it just keeps constantly happening on some days. Like there's, there's days where I just like, I fell over like so many times in a row that I just like stopped. And I was like, I need to relax for a minute. Like I'm going to snap my knee. Like I don't, I don't, I don't know what's going on right now. Every time I go to take a step, my foot's hitting something in the wrong. I, I think what I was doing was I was catching. Um, I think I was in an area where there was a bunch of like rolling sestrugi and whatever the way I was cresting through there, I, my foot, I think, kept hitting the, the uphill side of the next hill instead of flat ground. And it just kept jacking my knee up. And I, I just kept falling over right into the snow, Poof, you know, and you don't really, I, I couldn't. I couldn't tell what was going on because I couldn't see anything. Everything just looks the same color. White, white, white. Is it as extreme now as it was then? Oh, yeah. In that area? Changed. Absolutely. Nothing changed. It's, yeah. only, it's actually, it's only gotten colder technically. So this is the other funny thing is that, I mean, I watch the numbers. South Pole Station has been getting colder and colder every season since I was there. Those are the facts. <clears throat> So with that being said, did you ever find anything out there that didn't make sense? We'll call it an ooh part or just something that shouldn't have been there. Well, yeah. I, had a, I, I saw an event one day that I, I have, you know, my, my channel, Deciphering My Experience, I'm trying to figure things out, Right. So I, I don't have all of the answers. I just have my experiences and I'm trying to interpret them. Um, I'm going to throw something out there, Rex. I think you can wrap your head around this. I call it reframing a memory, right? So imagine when you're a kid, you have a recollection of something and in your house, you have a picture and you have a picture on the wall, but technically that picture is sitting in a matted frame and you can look at that picture and you can have a recollection. But if you were to take that picture off the wall, remove it from the matted frame, you're going to now also see more of that photo. Did you 
change history. No, you just looked at the photo with a, with a bigger perspective, a newer set of eyes, so to say. And that's where I feel like I'm at with a lot of things in my life and why I started my channel. One of those things happened at South Pole. Um, when I first started discussing things about South Pole, a, a lady had inquired. And at the time, I, I was describing it like it was an asteroid or something like that. But in hindsight, I really, I really am reframing this memory to the point, I, th I think I might have seen a UFO at the South Pole. And the reason being is it never went down, okay? I watched this thing. Same, same return trip that I was talking about before when I was coming back from the telescope and I had burned my cheek. Um, same exact path. So I was walking back to the elevated station on another day, um, and it wasn't stormy. It was, it was rather clear out. Um, and I, for whatever reason, I decided to look upward into the sky. And in the distance in front of me is the elevated station proper, but now over it, coming from my left, which would have been grid north at that location, in the sky was the biggest thing I've ever seen in my life like a huge, giant, round, and I mean round like a globe, what looked like this giant burning ball that was tearing across the sky so fast. And it was like, so there was the burning ball in the front, and then there was like a trail of flames behind it that was substantial. And then behind the section of trailing flames was a large section of what would be trailing smoke. Like after all of the combustion was, there's the fire and then the trail of smoke. And then this whole entire thing, the big flaming ball, the, the flaming trail and the smoke trail um, was taking up so much of the sky. And now consider that we're at 9,300 feet of elevation. There's no mountains, there's nothing. So everything else technically drops down. So from our perspective, I can't even begin to calculate how much miles this thing is covering in my field of view, so to say, to go all the way from the horizon line to the left, to then pass over our facility straight as an arrow, to then continue all the way out through to the other horizon as well. To me, now in hindsight, seems that that was a determined path. It was linear and with motion, and it never went down. It's not like it came from up high and I saw this thing come down and go down into the ice somewhere in the distance. I watched it go all the way from the horizon on the left, across my entire field of view, and then all the way out to the horizon, like a damn plane, technically. You know, so that to me was some sort of controlled flight. I don't know, it never dropped. Could have been a secret military craft even. I, I don't, I, yeah, it could have been anything, but for me, the fact that now I, I I can't get rid of the idea that I know that it never dropped. And it was when I was conversing with her at the time because she was asking me about UFOs and I was like, nah, I never saw UFOs. And I was describing this to her at the time. But now ever since I described that, I'm like, man, it never dropped though. So it's like, I don't know. I think I saw something. And you also said that there were satellites out there in the dark sector. Uh, there's telescopes in the dark sector and the satellites going through the entire sky. I mean, I could watch, um, I could watch a Iridium satellite crossover. Um, not, many, not many satellites go from pole to pole. Most of them are equatorial. And then they, they move around uh, the equator. And then as they fail, they get closer to the pole. And then, just, and then people don't really use them. But the Iridium satellites actually go around the other way. They go from pole to pole. And you can watch them at the South Pole as they rip across the sky. Yeah, I meant to say telescopes. Thank yep, you. Yep. Um, but the, that satellite thing, that sounds awesome. So iridium, that's basically radioactive, like a radioactive yep. satellite. <laughs> iridium is uh, an isotope, I think, a radioactive isotope. So you mm -hmm. <laughs> what were those telescopes looking for? Do you know? Did you ever get a yes. chance to see what they were seeing? Oh, absolutely. I did a lot of work with them in their crews. So the, the South Pole Telescope proper is basically looking out for um, other star systems and clusters and planets and things like that. And they're finding tons of them, tons and tons and tons all over the place. And then you also have, um, they have uh, MAPO, which is another telescope out in the dark sector. Also, again, cosmological stuff. That's the vast majority of what they're doing at the South Pole is looking off of the planet for, for signs of life and things like that that are important. Um, also in the dark sector, they have the ice cube neutrino detector 
which is a, a fantastic machine. Um, you know, again, you, you wonder what these things do. I always, I always feel like there's primary, secondary, tertiary agendas and things like that. Um, but they, they present it as, um, you know, it's, it's looking for neutrinos and it does do that. It looks for neutrinos and it finds neutrinos. Um, but boy, it's a, that's a big, big, big device. And they put a lot of money in that thing. That covers miles, that thing. It's, a, it's an array in the ice. Miles and miles and miles of wire in that thing. Got any photographs of that? Um, I don't have the underneath stuff. I have, um, I have a bunch of like, um, like info stuff. Like I got discs and things that I could, I could probably share with you in the future. All kinds of like, like slideshows and things that they give us, like to educate us when we're there. Like the real, I mean, this is the program stuff. Like this is, you know, I, I do actually have, I, I could put together something for you where it shows like the actual facility, like overview shots and things like that. Like I have like press release things too that they use for, you know, kids in schools and things like that. You know, this is the South Pole Station, but they're very informative and they, they, they're some of the best pictures, I guess, technically. Um, a lot of the stuff for the uh, ice cube neutrino detector, it's down in the ice technically. So what you would best get is they have like shots where it's uh, like an overview and they'll show you what the array looks like. Um, but for all practical purposes, when you go there, it's all down in the ice. It's, it's, it's buried. There's a blue building on top with some silver towers that have the cabling going down and they have all like the, um, the computer servers and stuff in there. Um, that run the array, but the array is embedded in the ice. It's a massive thing. They have what they call DOMs, digital optical monitors, and they're like these uh, plexiglass balls that are like the size of a, a basketball. And that's what they're using to detect the, the neutrinos. So they take, um, they call it a string of DOMs, and it's two miles long. So basically they, they go from the top of the ice and they use water to drill down and make a hole. Excuse me. I think it was like, it was like 32 or 34 inches in diameter, this hole, right? That goes down for two miles. If you're brave, you jump over one. <laughs> you, you just step right over it. It's very, it's very uh, emboldening to be like, wow, if I mess this up, I'm going to drop down the two-mile ice hole. <laughs> yeah, I'd want to know what was down there at the bottom. Oh, they pull things out it's in the, the, the ice cube drillers. They, there was, they, oh, Ooh. yeah, there's all kinds of stuff that they've pulled out of the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, um, give, give us a couple of. Uh... They've pulled out like palm tree pieces and, and yeah, there's, they've pulled up garbage from other camps and things like that. Um, that's correct. I forgot about that. Yes, the ice cube drillers would find weird stuff, rocks and things. Yeah, because they would go down. They would go, they would go down to the surface. And it's not that hard. So that's another thing that I do find funny, actually, in the, in the science world. You know, they talk about, oh, and, you know, the Russians spent all these years drilling down to get to such and such. You know how fast it is to get down through the ice? It's such a joke. They make it out like it's hard. It's really easy. It's extremely <laughs> easy to go two miles down through the ice. You just need water. Yeah, and didn't you say that, like, what you were working on at the station you were at, it was going down a few hundred feet anyway? Yeah. Yeah, so it, it, it could all go down. Yeah, it's, it's the easy. The Rodwell system or whatever? Absolutely. It? Yeah, it's easy to get rid of the ice. So I think it's funny when scientists around the world, um, for some reason, present it like it takes so long. And I guess it's just so they can get extended funding. I don't know. If they, anybody wants to drill through the ice in Antarctica on the cheap, you can hire me and I'll get you through there a lot faster. <laughs> That's what I wanted to talk about because the, the media certainly makes it as it's completely off limits with the treaty that they push. Mm -hmm. And somebody just got arrested going out there on his own uh, on a sailboat or something. He actually took a sailboat out to Antarctica and they arrested him when he got back to New Zealand or something like that. Um, he must because, have done something else wrong. Well, he, I think he told people he was going out there and so they wanted to make a point of it. You're allowed to. There's nothing. It directs. If you have money, you can go there right now. There's nothing stopping you. See, that's what people need to to understand because the media is really pushing it as it's off limits. It's off limits. And if you go there and you don't have the right. Everything's off limits. If you're poor, Disneyland is off limits. If you're poor, that's what it really boils down to. Anyone can go to Disneyland. If you have the money, anyone can go to the South pole. If you have the money. 
straight up. Antarctica is just the continent for the wealthy or governments. It's, right. it's, just, it's hands off for poor people. So how do we get there then? Let's say we wanted to do an expedition because I do want to put together an expedition to get mm -hmm. to Antarctica. I've got a few other people that are very well researched in this as well. And we want to go check out the location where we think the, the or where the data, let me repeat that. We want to go to the location where the data points to there being underground facilities um, post-World War II. 10-4, how far in from the coast are you intending to go? When you say you've got a, a I don't need your specifics on your location. No, no, I know. I don't, I'll, give it to you. I'll give it to you. I don't, I'm just thinking. I'm trying to it's figure. I don't, I don't know. It's one thing to get to the coast. It's one, it's, it's, I mean, <laughs> let's just put it this way. There's an old saying about Antarctica. And they say that once you pass 60 degrees south, there's no law. Once you pass 70 degrees south, there's no hope. And once you pass 80 degrees south, there's no God. So the further you want to go south, it just becomes exponentially more problematic. And the coastline is one thing, but now if you want to move further inland, logistics and support, I mean, you just, it's, this is where the cost comes in. Because again, no one's stopping you from going there, but to understand what you're really trying to do and you're really trying to be prepared for, the expense of dealing with that is, the, is overcoming the obstacle of making sure that you're keeping people safe and alive. Because there are no resources. You literally, you are your rescue plan as well. So whatever you're planning on doing, A, has to work. And if it doesn't, you now have to figure it out with the resources that you brought because no one's coming to help you there. Would it be better to go through South America, Argentina? Yes. So we could get, so we could get down to the tip of Argentina and then catch a boat from there. To Absolutely. The yep, you, can go, you go down to uh, the tip of Argentina. Um, uh, you can go to Ushuaia or I think Puente Arenas, either one of those locations, and you can, you can charter boats for what you're talking about. When we go, do you want to go? Hell yeah. Okay. That's an awesome yeah. Question. Dude, yeah, we got to have you. And I'm going to be doing an event here in March, probably, LeCon 2021. Would love uh, to have you as a speaker. And uh, maybe you could show off some of your photographs and some of that. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'll put something together a little bit more, more pointed for our next conversation. This is a great first conversation in the meeting, Rex. I, you know, there's, there's, there's so much to cover. And um, like, like you said on the front end, like today's, we can do South Pole, we can do Antarctica, but I'm, I've got an experienced life as well. There's other topics that we can get into that I know that you're versed in as well that we can have a lot of fun on. Oh, that sounds great. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's do it. Because, yeah, yeah. We've, we've been talking for an hour and a half and it just flew That's, past, man. Just yeah. 90 minutes. It did go nothing. quickly. I, I, you're, you're, uh, you have the gift of gab for sure. And I love watching your show because you can, you can bring so many different angles together. And I feel like I'm right, like that's what I'm also trying to do is that so many different topics I do believe are interconnected and we have a lot of specialists in many fields that I think we just need to get in the room together and, and, and intercommunicate a bit and be like, you know, what you're saying is true and what you're saying is true. But did you guys ever think of talking to each other and figuring out that now what this guy is saying is true also? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, let me ask you one more question here. Sure. Hollow earth, entrance to inner earth, anything like that? Out there, um, maybe, possibly? Off, off of what I've studied historically, I would say that my experience does not um, directly support it. Um, it certainly doesn't negate it in any way, shape, or form. But from what I've seen historically about the topics and the people and the activities in Antarctica, I, I am a firm believer that there is other things going on. That's part of what I'm trying to do is is bring to light that it is different and not as presented, but I have to be very careful in how I present that because like I stated earlier, my crew only had 49 people on it. Um, so certain info streams in my life, so like South Pole or even other directions, certain things that come out of my mouth, other parties are going to know that I only know it because of a particular person. So I guess like being a reporter, I guess I have to protect where I get information from. So the South Pole stuff I do enjoy talking about, but I have to be guarded on how I present certain information because I can't get other people in trouble. So I, I, I'm, I'm walking a fine line right now, <laughs> but I enjoy it. Folks, this is for entertainment purposes only. Correct. This is a live action role playing game. Any similarities are pure coincidence. Yep. Now, with that being said, let's, let's go to, so the area you were at, the South Pole, mm -hmm. was, 
do you know how far away that is from what people like Admiral Byrd said when they were supposedly made it to this inner earth location? I mean, do you know the coordinates there versus there? I'm, I am told that we were very close to the spot that Byrd was referring to as the Oasis Seas. Okay. I'm told that I've never been to the Oasis. It is my understanding that it is in the no fly zone that is in proximity to the South Pole. I do know that that stuff exists, but I haven't myself flown over there, you know? So it's, you know, there's a lot of people that say that the South Pole itself is a no fly zone, which isn't true because planes come in and out. And Antarctica, for all practical purposes, in reality, just because of logistics, it's inherently a no-fly zone. People aren't going to go in that direction because there's no point in it and there's no support. A lot of our flight lines and shipping lanes in the entire planet have been determined for thousands of years. We don't deviate. Our shipping lanes have been like that for thousands. There's so many parts of this planet we've never gone to yet because we're scared to because it's theoretically unsafe and not proven. So planes don't fly over Antarctica because what happens if it goes down? Nothing. You just die. No one can come help you at all. No one can even investigate it. So it's off limits, mostly just because there's no support staff for anything going wrong. It doesn't exist there. But you did say there was a place that absolutely is no fly zone. Yes. Yes. Not far from South Pole. As far as planes fly, there is a known, I've seen it on the maps. There is a no fly zone. And I know I, I was How never big is it? Like it's the area big. itself? Ooh, I, I'm trying to remember the scale of the map I was looking on. I would just say relative to our facility, um, it was huge. I'm, I'm picturing, like, uh, I'm picturing the, the map that I was looking at, the blueprint, and the facility was indicated as very small. And I would have to say that it was maybe, maybe it would have been like 40 miles from us. And then with that being said, it, I'm trying to guess on acreage wise of something like that. It probably, it's, it's huge. It may be 30 by 40 miles or something or something like that. <clears throat> do you think it was like maybe a military base out there is probably why it's no fly zone? Or do you think it's something they just don't want people seeing from space or from the air? That's a tough one to say. You know, it, um, it wasn't communicated to me. Um, as far as flight lines go and why planes are told not to fly places, um, presuming that there's nothing there, there should only be ice, right? So if there's no facilities there and it's only ice, then there's nothing to see and they should let planes fly over um, is the way that I look at it. Um, the only thing that I could think of that would justify it would be if there's maybe some sort of magnetic anomaly that might be problematic because, again, um, there's always challenges when you're discussing Antarctica and the South Pole. So for every trade. So I would imagine that for pilots, it's actually challenging to navigate to the South Pole with whatever equipment they normally would use because it's not going to, like, all their magnetic stuff is dysfunctional there. Um, so it could be that it's a no-fly zone for some reason of flight paths and function. I'm not sure. Um, There's an Anunnaki base there, folks. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's actually where my brain wants to go because I don't see a justification for locking up areas in Antarctica, to be honest. Like, from what I experienced, it's this so few and far between people there that, like, to even make a point of saying, like, don't go there. It's like, well, who, who are you telling this to? There's no one here to tell it to. Like, who's going to be flying over there that you need to tell this to? You know, like, why are all these doors locked? Like, who's going to break into anything here? Like, there's not some dude driving down the street, like, I'm going to go walk into this building. You know, so stuff like that I found hilarious. You know, the most, if you think about some places in the world that could be the very best to um, run military operations without exposure, without being seen, you know, hiding out, the only thing that's going to be able to see you out there are satellites. Mm -hmm. Unless, you know, you've got people that are special forces that have mm -hmm. all the equipment out there and, and do recon on you. It's going to be almost impossible to get out there. So, and they could probably track those people getting there at least. Um, well, they, they might be getting there clandestinely, but still, that's, that's the spot, man. That, that is the spot. It, it's super remote. It, you're right. In that capacity, if you want to guard something, if you want to safeguard something, there's really no place on this planet that's safer 
than the South Pole Station in the wintertime because no one's going to be able to go get it. And we did have massive data centers, and that, that made me think of stuff, you know, because I know data centers like to keep cool, and um, people like to also keep them away from stuff to where they can't be impacted. And I also wondered about our data centers there, and I was like, wow, you know, this is pretty interesting. That's a big data center. Yeah. You know, it must be for science because everything we did was for science. That was the, that was the battle flag that everything was operated under it's for science, you know, put that well, snow well, machine away. It's too cold out there and it's going to be bad for the snow machine, but we need that antenna up. So get your butt out there for science. Yeah. In the name of science, they can do just about anything. Yeah. You can't take that snow machine out though. It's too cold. It'll, you'll break it. Okay. I'll go then. I'll walk. If you break yourself, then we got to, yeah. you know, then they have to ship somebody else out to take your place. So they don't want to yeah. do that either. But man, I, I'm telling you, Eric, this is awesome. And it, I don't know if you've had a chance to look through the chat because we're doing this show live on the website, leakproject.com. We're going to upload it on YouTube here in a minute. And it's going to be, uh, you know, premium or premiere on the YouTube channel. Nice. Chat, I'll go back is, and take a look. chat is hilarious. Wow. Y'all are, are making me laugh. So thanks for being here with us, everybody. I appreciate you joining us here at The Leak Project. Now, uh, in finishing, please give everybody the name to your YouTube channel. And if you've got a website or, you know, Facebook page, and I definitely want to do this again. So, Oh, you. you got it, Rex. Uh, my name is Eric Hecker. You can follow along at Deciphering My Experience. I got thrown off of Facebook, so you won't find me there. I'm not going back. I suggest everybody leaves. I'm on MeWe, and I'm also on YouTube, just trying to get my videos out there and, and share my experiences with folks like Rex so that we can all learn that we've been a bit bamboozled. I mean, that's the direction I'm coming from, is that we're all human beings and we're all in this together. And I often say that 80% of our lives match and 20% of our lives are different from everybody else's. And I'm just trying to get everybody to share their 20% and not be ashamed of it. We've, we've all got weird stories in us. Right on. Well, thanks again. And everybody have an amazing day. 2021, the year of the conspiracy theorists. So congratulations for that. And be the change you want to see everybody. Thanks for Absolutely. being here with us. Thank you, Rex. Thank you.